Today in Crisis Counseling, we're going to talk a little bit about the Apostle Peter and delve into a Bible story which isn't real well known. So, a little bit of background. This, um, this takes place after the Ascension. Peter is uh, the, the foremost Apostle. I mean, you read those early uh, chapters in Acts, and people are bringing sick people to Jerusalem with the hope that Peter's shadow is cast upon them. So this is a fellow held in pretty high esteem. Of course, he's the spokesperson for the apostles. He's, he's the bold one out front and center speaking for Jesus. And, and Jesus uses him. He's, he's the famous rock, right? Uh, yeah, various debate and controversy what, uh, what Jesus meant when he said to Peter, and on this rock I will build my kingdom. But I, I think what everybody can agree is that Peter's a pretty important fellow in the early Christian church, to say the least. Was Peter uh, flawless? Well, we all know Peter made a lot of mistakes as a disciple, right? I mean, we think of the time that he denied Jesus three times. But um, certainly in the days after Jesus ascended, Peter was, uh, should we use the word infallible? No, he, he certainly wasn't. Uh, we know that he still remained a sinner, just as all of God's people this side of heaven are sinners capable of mistakes and errors. And also capable of growth. And one of the things that Peter had to grow into is a better understanding of how to regard others who weren't like him. Now, Peter was uh, a Jew, and in that particular time period, those who were, were Jewish were raised not to accept Gentiles. Um, by accept, meaning you know, they wouldn't eat with them, they wouldn't have any kind of a close friendship or relationship with Gentiles. Peter literally had to be told by God to start associating with Gentiles. You can read all about that in the book of Acts, how, how God told Peter, sit down and eat this food, which you used to think was you know, unclean, but now I'm calling it clean. Uh, hang out at the house of Simon the Tanner. There's interesting thoughts about how a tanner would have been ceremonially unclean, but now Peter's got to hang out at the house of, of Simon the Tanner. And, and Peter comes to learn to great joy that God has welcomed the Gentiles into the covenant, that you don't have to be born Jewish or even convert to Jewish religious practices. You don't have to be circumcised in order to be saved. That used to be the case for God's covenant people. You weren't circumcised, you weren't in the kingdom. But now things have changed, and it's, it takes Peter, and, and understandably so. After a year, after a lifetime of certain mindset, it's not going to happen overnight where he's going to suddenly have a, a completely different uh, perspective on things. He has to kind of grow into this new perspective on things. And, and so he does then associate with Gentiles, which causes some controversy. Then some people start questioning Peter on that. And then Peter tells them all about the vision that he saw, the, the message that he got from the Lord. And then there's some rejoicing as other uh, Jewish Christian believers come to rejoice that Peter has, uh, or that, that uh, Gentiles have now been welcomed into God's covenant. Now that's all background to set the stage for the text that I'd like to share with you today from the book of Galatians. Now there's a controversy going on in the church of Galatia specifically about this question whether one needs to adhere to Jewish religious practices in order to be saved, circumcision being the, you know, the, the primary one that um, the people are arguing about. And so there's these Christ, Gentile Christians in Galatia who've never been circumcised. And then this group of people comes into Galatia and they're like, guys, if you don't get circumcised, you're going to hell. And this causes a great deal of consternation, which leads Paul to write his letter to the Galatians. Really a wonderful, wonderful book of the Bible. Um, Luther drew heavily on Galatians because it articulates the gospel very clearly. No, you don't, you aren't saved by circumcision. You're saved by Jesus. Faith in him is what's required, and not only is it required, it's a gift from God, so it's given to you. It's not anything you do. Faith not works, right? This is what Galatians is all about. But you, uh, what our, actually what our whole religion is all about, really. But um, in Galatians chapter 2, we get this story, which again, you, you may not know this one. This is what Paul writes. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Gee, who's this Cephas guy who's, <laughs> who's opposing Paul? Uh, that would be Peter. Cephas is just another name for Peter the Rock. All right, so we've this, 
Did you know that was in the Bible? Peter and Paul have this little, uh, a little rendezvous and tete-a-tete and a little bit of a controversy. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? That's Galatians 2, verse 11 to um, 14. Okay, a lot going on here, right? What, what, what exactly is going on here? So Peter was hanging out with these Gentile Christians. And by hanging out, I mean, back then, table fellowship, if you ate with somebody, that meant you were, you know, that you were the same as them in, in terms of social status and things like that. So Peter was eating with them, these uncircumcised Gentile Christians. And then this other group gets to town, these Judaizers. There's this guy, James, not to be confused with the good Jameses in the Bible. Um, the minute they show up in town, Peter makes himself scarce. He's not eating with the Gentiles anymore. In fact, he kind of gives the impression that it's wrong to be a practicing Christian without practicing these Jewish religious traditions. And Paul gets to, and this is, this is going on in Antioch, and, and Paul gets there, and in front of the assembly, he says, Peter, I got to call you out on this, buddy. <laughs> now, there's this interesting passage earlier in Galatians where Paul learned from Peter, you know, and Paul was converted to Christianity. He didn't just start overnight you know, going and talking about Jesus to large groups. Um, he, he trained himself, and he went and sat down with Peter for a couple of weeks and said, guys, or I said to Peter, like, tell me everything that I need to know about the three years you spent with Jesus. And so Peter mentored Paul in the faith. But now Paul is coming back and saying, Peter, you're out of line here. What you're doing is not in accord with the gospel. How, how forcefully does he put this here? When I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And now, we don't actually know what Peter said in response. Paul chose not to record that for us. I have a guess, though. My guess is that Peter repented. <laughs> Knowing uh, what I know about Peter, he um, he was not afraid to repent. He 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 would admit when he made a mistake. That's one thing you can say about that guy. <laughs> he made a lot of mistakes in Scripture, but he don't he owned them. So um, at the at the end of Galatians, we get this this vision that Paul led, again lays out that we're all one in Christ. And it's actually in Galatians where we have the famous passage about there being neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free, nor male nor female, yet we are all one in Christ Jesus. So what's the takeaway here for us today? Uh, we don't have the same kind of controversy that we're dealing with, that, that pa Peter and Paul are dealing with. But what intrigues me is the idea that a sanctified leader of the church like Peter uh, truly a holy man of God who, I mean, at this point, this guy's literally raised a dead woman back to life. This is how full of the Holy Spirit he is. And yet he's still on a journey. He's still on a journey about what it truly means to accept others who are not like him, but whom God is considering the same as him. So here's the thing I kind of, the, the thing that kind of hits me hard. If Peter can still be on a journey about acceptance and, and love of others and recognition that earthly differences do not matter in God's eyes. Uh, what about us? <laughs> have any of us reached a point in our sanctification where we can say, okay, now I have no more growth left. I now completely understand what it means to be loving and accepting of others who are not like me. Well, maybe you're better than Peter, but I'd be hesitant to say that about myself. So uh, I, I tend to come down thinking we're, we're all on a journey here, and we all have room for growth on what it means to love and accept others uh, who are, are not the same as us. So 
God's blessings on your journey, he will be the one ultimately. Maybe he will teach us the way he did Peter. Someone will come into our life and just kind of call us out. <laughs> Other times it may be less dramatic and maybe more gradual, but ultimately God is at work in our lives. And I, I pray that he will lead all of us further along on the journey that we are so that we might come to a better understanding of, of what it means to truly love our neighbor as ourselves. God bless you.